Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to my channel. I hope you are all having an incredible day today. In today's video, we are going to be covering a very mysterious Mystery Monday case. I have not been able to stop thinking about this case since I started researching it. It has been heavy on my mind. It is so incredibly sketchy. But before we do get into the case, I just want to thank today's sponsor, Casetify. You guys know I am obsessed with Casetify cases, so I had to pick up a few more and Oh my goodness, you guys are going to actually die. The cow print with the pink exterior, are you kidding me? It is beautiful, it's perfect, it's incredible, it's amazing, it is show-stopping, wow, 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 chef's kiss. Never been more obsessed with a phone case in my life. I also got one that has a mirrored backing, and this mirror is legit. Like, I could actually do a full face of makeup on it. It is unreal, and not only are these cases so cute, but they have military-grade drop protection, so you can drop your phone with this case on for more than six feet without having to worry about ruining your phone like I did. I have two phones uh, because I bought the 11 Pro but I kept my older phone because I don't like the camera on the new one and I dropped my old phone and it is didn't have a case on it and it is completely unusable like it has a mind of its own <laughs> just is like swiping and it's not good so the cases are a necessity for me. The quality of these cases is amazing. They're not bulky despite being so protective and they're completely customizable too. You can add names, initials, you can change the exterior. Like I got my cow print and rock on cases with a pink exterior instead of clear because pink. And if you guys are interested in checking out any of their cases, you can get a cheeky 20% off if you head to casetify.com slash Bella. I will leave the link and all of the information in the description box down below. And let's go ahead and get into today's case. In December of 1985, in the quiet town of Fayetteville, North Carolina, 28-year-old Debbie Wolf's body was found at the bottom of a pond near her secluded cabin where she lived with her two dogs, Mason and Morgan. Authorities deny that there was anything sketchy about this case at all. However, those closest to Debbie believe that she was a victim of foul play. Debbie Wolf was born on the 19th of June in 1957 in Blytheville, Arkansas. In December of 1985, when Debbie was 28 years old, everything in her life seemed to be going right. Her relationship with her boyfriend was going really well and was starting to get serious. She lived in her own quaint, secluded little cabin, which was about 100 meters or so from the main road, with her two dogs, Morgan and Mason, who she absolutely spoiled. She was working as a nurse at the local Fayetteville Veterans Administration Hospital, which she not only enjoyed herself, but those she worked with enjoyed having her there. She was really well liked by staff and patients, and she was good at her job, and she never missed a shift. Debbie and her mother, Jenny Edwards, had a really close relationship. They spent Christmas Day of 1985 together. Jenny got Debbie a giant stuffed unicorn and Debbie got her mother a set of male and female novelty dolls if you know what I'm saying bits and all and for her mother's 50th birthday she also got her a male stripper so they had a very fun close relationship Debbie had a holiday shift at work on the Christmas day so she took the stuffed unicorn her mother had given her to work wished all of her co-workers a Merry Christmas and headed home at 4 p.m. when her shift was over nobody hears from her that night and then the next day on the 20th 6th of December, she didn't show up for her 8am shift and immediately her co-workers were concerned because like I said, she never missed a shift. She was very reliable. So this was extremely out of character for her. They tried calling her phone. They got no answer. So they tried calling Jenny. Jenny, again, immediately concerned because it was so out of character. She tried to call Debbie and got no response again. So she decided to call up a family friend named Kevin Gordon and head over to Debbie's cabin to see what was going on and she was fearing the worst at this point but hoping for the best hoping that she was just at home sick and you know was asleep was unable to call in was missing all these calls when Jenny and Kevin arrived at the cabin things seemed sketchy right away Debbie always kept a tidy home she always took extremely good care of her dogs but when Jenny and Kevin arrived there were beer cans lying in the yard her car wasn't in its usual spot there were personal items scattered on the floor and the two dogs hadn't been fed. They had a look around the rest of the house, which is when Kevin found Debbie's purse tucked into the side of the bed. And it's not where she usually kept it. And on top of that, the way in which it was like tucked into the corner of the bed looked like somebody was trying to hide it. 
After searching the house and finding no trace of Debbie, no clues as to where she might be, Jenny decided to check her answering machine to see if there were any messages on there that might give them some clues as to what was going on, but this only left them with more questions. There was only one message on the answering machine, and this was from an unfamiliar male voice. Hey Deb, miss you here at work today. I uh, just wondering how you doing. Uh, if you're able to give me a call up here at the ward, I'm at 822-7007, or give me a call at home tonight. Uh, You've been out a lot of days, you made me worry when you miss another one. I just want to make sure you're okay. Bye. The voicemail left Jenny feeling uneasy because not only was it an unfamiliar voice, but what he was saying in the voicemail wasn't true. At the time the voicemail was left, Debbie had only been out of work a few hours at most, not a few days. So after having found no sign of Debbie in the cabin or the surrounding areas, Jenny and Kevin decided to go and search this small little pond which was just 15 meters or so from Debbie's cabin. And after having no luck in their own searches, Jenny called the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department. The responding officer was Captain Jack Watts who brought bloodhounds with him to the cabin to help search the area and upon arrival he assumed for some reason that Jenny and Kevin had done a proper search of the lake and didn't make a request for divers to search the lake. Which I mean I know I say this a lot in most of these cases but right off the bat bad police work. Jenny and Kevin just did a cursory search of the pond from the edges of the pond. They aren't divers, they don't have the proper equipment to do a full search, and even so, even by some chance these people are divers with all of this diving equipment, police should still do their own searches. Captain Watts did a quick search of the house and surrounding areas with the bloodhound but found no signs of Debbie, and then he told Jenny that it would have to be three full days, 72 hours, before he could organize a proper search. I mean, all the research shows that the first 48 hours is the most crucial time period in a missing persons case, and they're like, sorry, we can't organize a search until three days later. On the 27th of December, Debbie's stepfather, a retired army sergeant, John Edwards, went to her house to feed her dogs, and while he was there, he found a nurse's uniform with short sleeves lying on the kitchen floor floor. I couldn't figure out from my research whether or not this nurse's outfit had been there while Jenny and Kevin had been there the day before and they'd simply overlooked it or if it wasn't there when they were there but personally I fail to believe that Jenny would overlook anything uh, in this case when her daughter is missing. Now it wouldn't be until five days after Debbie's disappearance that a full search would be conducted a full five days. Still assuming the pond had been searched, they didn't organize any divers to come to the property. Detectives with bloodhounds kind of just walked around the cabin, the surrounding areas, and then they just like walked around the edge of the pond and like looked out over it from the edges as if if there was a dead body in there, it couldn't be down the bottom of the pond without them being able to see it. Like it was a muddy pond, but that was the extent of their search. They didn't find any traces of Debbie and Debbie's mother Jenny asked them like, could you not at least put a little paddle boat on the pond and paddle around to get more of a look and they were like look it's too late now but we'll let you know and then nothing came of it. Jenny was understandably so not satisfied with the Cumberland County Sheriff's investigation so she decided to hire her own dive team and on the 1st of January in 1986 in the freezing cold weather Kevin Gordon and his friend Gordon Childress both of whom were familiar with rescue work searched the pond themselves. About two minutes after they entered the pond Gordon found two sets of footprints indented into the thick mud on the edge of the pool along with what appeared to be drag marks. So he followed the drag marks deeper into the pond for about 10 meters or so and by this point the water's about 1.6 to 1.7 meters deep and this is where he finds Debbie's body. Her body was in what Gordon described as a burn barrel, a rusty 55 gallon an oil type drum with two holes in it and immediately after the discovery Kevin and Gordon phoned the police who arrived promptly and positively identified the body as that of Debbie Wolf. An autopsy on Debbie's 
body was conducted on the 2nd of January by Dr. William Oliver at the North Carolina Medical Examiner's Office. Since Debbie was found in a pond, Dr. Oliver assumed that she had drowned and that he would find water in her lungs. However, he only found half a teaspoon of water in her upper bronchial area. There was also no white froth or foam in her mouth or nose areas, which often indicates that a victim was alive at time of submersion. Her body was in a relaxed position with her eyes and mouth shut, which is in stark contrast to how most drowning victims are found. Usually they're found with their eyes open in panic, possibly their mouths too as they gasp for air, and their bodies normally indicate a struggle. Dr. Oliver also found a few abrasions on a few of her fingers, which may indicate a struggle or fighting an attacker, possibly fighting her killer off. However, there were no other abrasions or indications of foul play on her body. Dr. Oliver reported her manner of death as undetermined because he couldn't determine how she died other than the fact that she hadn't drowned. Investigators from the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department believed that she just accidentally drowned, that she had simply fallen into the pond or that she had jumped into the pond trying to save one of her dogs that had gone in the pond and while she was in there became frightened and disoriented. They suggested that Debbie may have died due to immersion syndrome or trench foot which is a type of tissue damage caused by prolonged exposure to wet and cold conditions. It causes pain, swelling and sensory disturbances. The extremity first becomes cold, numb and painful followed by blistering and what doesn't make sense about this is that there were no signs of trench foot in her autopsy and her feet and her legs were both covered. So it's just like a strange theory for them to put forward at all in my opinion. Debbie's body also showed no signs of bloating or discoloration which surely there would be at least a little bit of that if she had accidentally drowned on the night of the 25th and her body had just been in the pond for almost a week. The coroner actually believed that because of the lack of discoloration and bloating that she hadn't been in the pond for very long before she was discovered and that she had been placed in the pond post mortem. A private investigator that Jenny later hired also agreed with this conclusion saying there was no way Debbie's body had been in the pond since the 25th. Kevin Gordon also stated that when he and Gordon Childress found the body she was pretty clean. Her clothes were clean, her face was clean, like there was no mud and silt on her yet it took them three days to get all of the mud and silt off their diving suits from the 20 minutes that they were in the water. Jenny even decided to hold Debbie's funeral as an open casket ceremony because because her daughter's body was so well preserved. And to further this, Jenny claimed that Debbie was an excellent swimmer. She would never even venture near the pond in the colder months because she had no reason to. Not to mention her body was found only 10 meters from the edge of the pond in a depth of you know 1.6 to 1.7 meters and Debbie was five foot three which is about 1.6 meters tall so she was at most like nine centimeters shorter than the area that she was found in she could I'm sure even just stand on her toes and be able to you know have her mouth out of water or just walk a couple of steps towards the edge of the pond that she was only 10 meters away from. Like, I don't know about you, but it just seems incredibly unlikely to drown in those sort of conditions. To make matters worse, the sheriff's office also flat out denied that there was ever a barrel that her body was in. They said that what Kevin and Gordon may have thought was a barrel might actually have just been her jacket that was ballooned out because of the water. Like. I'm confused. Debbie's mother Jenny said that while police were there getting Jenny's body, they were talking about how to mark up and transport and get the barrel out of the water. And then 10 minutes later, they left without having done any of that or without having taken the barrel. Kevin Gordon and Gordon Childress, the two men that found the body, refuted the police's theory and they said there was in fact a metal rusted 55 gallon type drum that the body was in. Jenny saw the barrel too, saying that she thought it may have been the barrel that Debbie usually kept full of firewood at the side of the house, which actually had been missing from its usual spot. And there was even an impression left in the grass at the house where the barrel usually sat. Like, I don't know what more you want. A deputy named Don Smith also went on record as saying that he remembers seeing a barrel the day the body was discovered. Like, there's all these people saying they'd seen the barrel. There was a barrel missing from her house, an indent where this barrel used to be. And they straight up were just like, what? 
barrel what are you talking about and police actually failed to collect the barrel like i said they were talking about marking it up and then ended up just leaving without taking the barrel never came back for it and by the next day when jenny and some family friends went back to the cabin the barrel was gone along with any evidence that it might have had on it despite the fact that police were insistent that this was all just a tragic accident debbie's family were convinced that something sketchy was going on here because things just weren't adding up two months later when Jenny received all of the clothes that Debbie was wearing when she was found from the medical examiner's office, she just felt like this totally confirmed her suspicions of something being sketchy. She was certain that the clothes that Debbie was wearing when she was found didn't belong to her. She received brown corduroy pants, which were too far too big for Debbie and far too long for Debbie and they were unzipped as well. The bra she was wearing was like three sizes too big for her. Debbie was a 34B and the bra that she was found wearing was a 38C. She was also found wearing a black t-shirt which was like a Pittsburgh Steelers t-shirt and nobody in Debbie's life could identify this t-shirt and that's the same with the jacket she was wearing. It was a brand new regulation army jacket. It was a men's size small and she actually did have an army jacket but it was a uh, men's size large it was from her brother and it was still in her closet in her cabin the jacket had no name tag and there was no way to trace where it had come from or who owned it. She was found wearing Nike shoes that were three sizes too big for her because she was a woman's size seven and the Nike shoes found on her were a men's size seven. These shoes also had no mud or silt on them whatsoever, which if the police's theory of this being an accidental drowning was true, makes absolutely no sense. The pond was surrounded in mud, so if she was anywhere near the pond at all, she would have had mud on the shoes. The bottom of the pond, mud. There were foot impressions and there were drag marks too. Jenny also found this super sketchy, so she inquired with the NC State Bureau of Investigation and they insisted that they had not altered them whatsoever. They hadn't cleaned them, they hadn't washed them, the shoes were exactly as they had been found when they were on Debbie. And this alone, I feel like discounts the police's trench foot theory, right? I mean, clues just kept adding up that there was some sort of foul play involved and detectives were like just almost outright ignoring them. If you remember the nurse's uniform that Debbie's stepfather found on her kitchen floor, this was confirmed to not have been the uniform that she wore the day that she disappeared because a co-worker came forward and said, I know she was wearing a long sleeve uniform because I was there and I spilled coffee on it. And that uniform that she was wearing the day she disappeared has never been found. The day of the 26th when Jenny and Kevin went to the cabin to go and look for Jenny, Debbie's car was not in its usual position. Usually she parked it outside of her house but it wasn't there when they arrived. Now the details of when the car was and wasn't outside of the cabin are a little bit all over the place but at some point the car was out front of the house but not in the position that she normally parked it in. While it was there they noticed that the driver's seat had been pushed all the way back when normally Debbie had it almost all the way forward because she was only five foot three. Jenny also said that Debbie never really fiddled with it or changed it because she had it how, we, how she liked it and nobody else drove the car, which makes sense. I never changed the settings in my car either. More recently, some new evidence came to light when Dr. Maurice Goodwin said he discovered through the case files that there was semen present inside of Debbie. However, back in 1986, DNA profiling really wasn't as advanced as it is today and the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department have since lost the vaginal swab and so any possible leads that could come from that have also been lost as well. And so now all we have are theories. Now, now, the first theory is the theory the police put forward, which is that this was an accidental drowning. I'd be pretty hard pressed to believe that this theory was true because the police just outright omit evidence to even make this theory plausible. Now, the first and most important thing is that she only had half a teaspoon of water at most in her lungs. And I feel like that alone should discount this entire theory. She wasn't discolored, she wasn't bloated, she was clean, her shoes were clean despite all of the mud and silt in the pond. And don't even get me started on the barrel that police just outright deny the existence of. I mean, what, did she jump in a barrel, 
somehow hop herself over into the pond and then drown without having gotten any water in her lungs in a completely relaxed position. And she was found just 10 meters from the edge of the pond at a depth of at most 1.7 meters. So it just isn't plausible in my opinion. The next theory is what Jenny believes happened, that she was being stalked, she was then kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and killed. Now under this theory it's plausible that maybe the man from the voicemail had something to do with this. Now I believe this theory because I feel like he left this voicemail preemptively, hoping that nobody would go and listen to it for a few days and then by the time they heard it the timeline would add up of like oh you haven't been at work for a few days, where have you been? Police did find the man from the voicemail so Debbie was in charge of coordinating the volunteers at the hospital and this man was a volunteer at the Veterans Hospital and he sort of had a bit of a crush on Debbie. He tried to pursue her multiple times and she obviously rejected him multiple times and said, you know, we can never be anything more than friends because I have a boyfriend, I'm not interested. And Debbie's friends and family confirmed that she had spoken about this guy pursuing her and had also spoken about rejecting him. Police claimed that they spoke to this man and cleared him of any involvement. Now, as I mentioned, Debbie was well liked at work. So there was another male volunteer who also had a crush on Debbie, but he was a bit more persistent and his advances made Debbie very uncomfortable. He had a long history of psychiatric illness and he just wouldn't take no for an answer. This man was also interviewed by police. They asked him to take a polygraph test, which he refused to do. He seemed to have some sort of alibi, but a couple days after police questioned him, he left the state altogether. Now, whether or not it was one of these men, I do feel like this theory holds the most weight. This was most likely not a burglary because there were no signs of theft. Her house was in dis. Array. There were beer cans littered in her front yard, which I'm inclined to believe Debbie wasn't drinking and it was most likely her attacker that was drinking these beers because Jenny thought it was just so weird that these beer cans were just discarded in the front yard. This isn't something that Debbie would do. And she was also found in men's clothes that didn't fit her, that nobody in her life could identify. Because all of the clothes and her shoes were clean, I'm inclined to believe Jenny's theory that she was kidnapped, they took her somewhere, maybe sexually assaulted her, murdered her, redressed her, and then brought her back to the pond to dispose of the body. A private detective named Robert Frasco also agreed with this conclusion. He cited the fact that her body was free of silt and mud, which likely meant that she was placed in there rather than had fallen in there. He also theorized that she could have been kidnapped in her own car, and this is why the driver's seat was all the way back instead of all the way forward when Debbie never changed changed these settings, especially if her attacker was a male that was larger than her, you know, considering the clothes she was found in were bigger than her. He also believes that the man who left the voicemail is the one that killed her. Oh, and not to mention the lost vaginal swab that indicated that there was semen inside of her. I just feel like everything points to this theory. Now, Against this theory, there really were no real signs of trauma, you know, besides the lacerations on her fingers, there was nothing else on her body that would indicate foul play. But at the same time, her cause of death was undetermined. She died somehow. It wasn't from drowning. In all of my research, I didn't see anything about a toxicology report, so I don't know if it's possible that she was drinking and fell unconscious, maybe she was drugged, and that's why there are no, you know, signs of foul play. Another theory is that this was the boyfriend, and I haven't really seen any evidence to suggest this, and I haven't really seen any theories mention this, but it popped into my head anyway. Maybe because I just watched the Chris Watts documentary on Netflix, but... <laughs> Relationship murders are far too common. And I feel like when somebody is murdered, the first person that you normally look at is the people closest to them, the family, significant others. I honestly haven't really seen any information about the boyfriend at all, so I really know nothing about the guy besides the fact that they were starting to get serious. I have no idea if the police even questioned him. I assume they did, surely. But if there weren't any defensive wounds, then maybe it was somebody she knew, like her boyfriend, somebody she trusted. Maybe 
if she was drinking, she was drinking with somebody she trusted, like her boyfriend, and she fell unconscious. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe she overdosed or something and died, and so he didn't want to get in trouble for it and hid the body. Also, if her body was taken, redressed, and brought back, it had to have been somebody who... or may have been somebody who knew a little bit about the investigation to know when they could bring the body back without having been seen. And this brings me to my next theory that maybe this was the police. I mean, they would know when to bring the body back, right? They did a shitty investigation. They lost the vaginal swab. They lost the barrel. They claim they never saw the barrel. They claim they never saw the footsteps and the drag marks. And they put forward a ridiculous theory that holds absolutely no weight. Like, the investigation was so bad that it almost seems like a cover-up. I don't think this theory is very likely. I don't think it's a cover-up so much. I feel like it's just really shitty police work, but worth mentioning. And the last theory that I have for this case is that maybe this was Gordon Childress, the friend that actually found the body. He was a friend of Kevin Gordon, Jenny's family friend, and he found the body within like literally five minutes of being in the water, like almost like he knew where to look. He was also helping out with the investigation, so he would have known when it was safe to bring the body back. And I feel like this also gave him an opportunity to dispose of the barrel because he knew police didn't take the barrel and so this gave him the opportunity to come back the next day dispose of the barrel before anyone could gather it from, for evidence or get any evidence off of it. Like one day he finds the body in the barrel, the next day the barrel is gone. I don't know, maybe the killer coming back to return the body if that's what they did was just all luck, just a major coincidence that they managed to come back and nobody was there. Personally I feel like this had something to do with the man who left the voicemail. I just really feel like like he left it preemptively thinking people would find the voicemail in a few days time and by then his timeline would add up of her not having been at work for a few days. He was obviously into her and I don't trust the police saying that they interviewed him, that he was fine and that's why they let him go, that he didn't have anything to do with the case because they did such a shitty job on the rest of the case. Why would they do well with this interview? You know, why would this interview be any different? Debbie's mother Jenny searched for answers until the day that she died in 2002 without any closure as to what happened to her daughter. So that is everything that I have for you today. That's all the theories, all of the information, but I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. I would love to know what theories you believe, or maybe there's a theory I didn't mention, and hopefully I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.